Okay, we're going to look at Jesus Christ as our Savior today. We're going to uh, explore the foundation that made all those other things possible. The hope for the future, the healing, and the straightening out or, or sanctifying of our lives. Um, what I really want to look at today is how Jesus' coming removes the penalty for our sin. That penalty that was the ultimate barrier between us and God. And we are going to be in John chapter 3. That was read for us here just a little while ago. Now, when we start talking about this salvation that Jesus has brought to us, we're, we're very good at explaining that it's a free gift, that it, uh, the church in the United States has been really good at, at explaining that there's nothing we can do to earn it. And unfortunately, to many people, that seems like a message that's just too good to be true. And we are, in our culture, taught to be cautious of things that seem like they're too good to be true. Uh, I have uh, I heard a story about a guy uh, this week who probably should have paid more attention to that concept. He got a telephone call. His name was Sam, by the way. I don't know him, but I heard his story. Uh, Sam got a phone call from someone who said, I'm a representative of the National Lottery, and you have won the $10 million lottery. All we need is a way to deliver it to you, so send us the routing number for your bank. And he did. He thought, well, you know, it's small chance that something might go wrong. So he sent the routing number. A week later, the money wasn't there. The guy called back and said, we've got a problem forwarding the money. Um, we think we can figure it out, but we need a transaction actually to happen. So send us $500 and we'll, uh, we'll fix it. Well, a week later, there's no money. So the guy calls back again and says, we've almost got it figured out. We just need a little bigger transaction. Send us $1,000. Sam thinks, well, a million dollars, you know, $1,500 investment, get a million, $10 million back. So he sends him the money. The next week it happens again, and the week after that. And pretty soon Sam is in hock for his house and borrowing money from his friends and can't make his car payment. And he realizes he's been had, and he calls the police, and they say, well, that we'll follow a report, but there's no way we're ever going to catch these people. And we look at that and say, well, of course it was a scam, Whenever it sounds too good to be true, it is. It happens to us all the time, doesn't it? it, it there's all kinds of things we see that sound too good to be true. I mean, have you ever listened to a political speech? Politicians are constantly off, uh, promising, you know, if you elect me, you're going to get peace and you're going to get prosperity. Everybody's going to be rich and there's not going to be any violence and the world's going to be wonderful. Well, I watch the news and it doesn't seem like they've come through on that promise. Or what about uh, product guarantees when you watch the commercials on late night TV? For $19.95, we can roll back that male pattern baldness for you. Yeah. Really? Sounds too good to be true. Or what about the miracle cures? I'm amazed. Every time I watch TV, I don't watch network TV very often, but they've got all these medicines that they're advertising. Like the doctors don't know what to prescribe for you to start with, and then they tell you about this wonderful medicine that's going to fix everything from, you know, ear aches to ingrown toenails, and, but it might cause chest pain, or it might cause heart disease, or it might cause liver to, your liver to fail, or, and all these other things because it's just too good to be true. And what about salvation? That whole thing where all we have to do is put our faith in Jesus Christ and everything will be fine, pie in the sky, by and by. And when I present it like that, I can kind of understand why some people are skeptical of Christ's message. It's no wonder why we have a hard time trusting in our culture today. And I think Nicodemus probably had the same problem. You know, as Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3 and, and asked Jesus questions about who he was, and he came at night, and they're having this conversation, and Jesus says something about being born again, and Nicodemus doesn't get it, so he asks him to clarify it, and he says, well, if you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the deeper things that I have to say, and Nicodemus says, well, how can these things be true? He's basically saying, wait a minute, that's too good to be true that can't happen. And Jesus takes the rest of this interaction and explains to Nicodemus that it's always been too good to be true. It's always been that way so that we would learn to trust God. 
And he starts by going all the way back to no less than Moses and how important trust was even in the Exodus. Jesus tells Nicodemus, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You might remember the story. It's in the book of Numbers where the, the people are just beginning their swing back from wandering in the wilderness. And they're going, they're going to start moving closer to the promised land and, and entering the promised land. And, and they get the, the grumbles again. They seem to get the grumbles almost every chapter in, the, in that uh, whole Exodus event. And they begin to complain that there wasn't enough food or water. God looks down and says, what do you mean there's not enough food or water? You've got all the gold that used to be in Egypt. We're walking, we're going through populated areas. All you have to do is buy the water. There's plenty of water to buy. Or, or what do you mean no food? Look at all the sheep and the goats and the cows and all the other things that you're herding through the wilderness. There's plenty of food. And it goes by so fast that we miss what they're really doing is they're telling God, you got us into this. Can you get us out of it? They're challenging God to prove himself. And God sees this happening, shakes his head. Well, I can't let that go on. If I, if, if I coddle them now, then I'll be coddling them for the rest of history because I can't let them into the promised land if they're not willing to take care of themselves. So he sends serpents. I don't know what kind of snakes they were, but uh, they could have been coral snakes, they could have been pit vipers, or it doesn't really matter. Whatever they were, they were very dangerous, very deadly. Uh, Any time a person got bit, they died. It doesn't seem like anybody recovered. Of course, the people realize what has happened, and they go to Moses and say, intercede for us. Get God to stop this. Again, make God do for us. Make God prove himself. God this time is gracious, and he tells Moses, make a bronze serpent and put it on a a pole in the middle of the camp that's high enough that no matter where you are in the camp, you can see it. And all you have to do when you get bit by one of these serpents is look up at the bronze serpent and you won't die. And the passage in, indicates or implies that nobody died, but it leaves us wondering if there were still people stubborn enough not to look. And then Jesus, as he tells Nicodemus this story, he says, just as that serpent was lifted up, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And that's a phrase that we need to not go past too fast. Because that's not just a passive um, mention or a broad reference to something being put higher than other things. This is a specific term. This, this being lifted up was the way that they would refer to crucifixion. And they didn't use that phrase in that way any other way. It always meant crucifixion. In fact, in, in some, t- some places where they didn't speak the Latin, that's what they would say, the judge would say to the soldiers, take him out and lift him up. Crucify him. So Nicodemus knew clearly that Jesus is talking about a crucifixion here. So that people could look at the crucified one and be saved. Because it's always been about trust. It's always been about letting God do it. And letting God decide. And then Jesus gives us what may be the most quoted verse in the entire Bible. If I asked, probably every person in this room could, could quote it. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son... The King James says his only begotten son. That indicates a specific, unique relationship. That whoever believes in him should never perish, but have everlasting life. See, Jesus came to be the one we trust in. 
Jesus came to be the one that we trust to do the work for us. He said later, right before his crucifixion, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through what I've done, through my death on the cross, which pays the penalty for everything everyone on earth has ever done. But after he tells Nicodemus that truth, he gives Nicodemus a choice. I've always pictured Christ as very polite. He didn't demand anything. He gave Nicodemus the choice, and he gives, gave Nicodemus the same choice that he gives every person in this room. The choice of decision. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Nicodemus, you have a choice. People of Grace Mennonite, you have a choice. People of Enid, Oklahoma, people of the United States, you have a choice. You can trust in God and be saved. The word condemned in uh, these, these two verses is also uh, translated judged. In fact, in verse 19, it is translated the word judge, judgment. And, and he starts out by saying, everyone can be saved. Anyone who believes, anyone who, I like the word trust when we talk about faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's what we're doing. We're trusting him to keep his promises. Trusting him when he promises that his death on the cross paid the price of our sin. Removed the penalty. And anyone who puts their trust in him is saved from that penalty and opens the door for all the other benefits, the healings, the hope, the, the life change that comes from being involved in Jesus. But you can also choose to mistrust and stay condemned. See, he didn't come to condemn, he came to save. Everybody's already condemned. There is a, a, a thread of sin that runs through the entire human race from Adam down. Paul says in Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and, and that's been our experience. Every person on planet earth at some point in time has had some thought and says some word, has done some deed that did not please God and made him sad. If you uh, read the Apostle John in 1 John, he defines sin as lawlessness. Anyone who doesn't follow the law of the Old Testament is a sinner. And those who put their faith in Jesus Christ and do not follow the law of love is a sinner. And so we're all condemned. Uh, you know, I, it, it's an old joke, but I can point around the room, but I've got three fingers pointing back at me. We're all in this. I think that's grace. Because until you need salvation, you can't be given salvation. Until you need grace, you can't receive grace. And that grace is offered to every single person. So we've been asked to trust in Jesus. And since trust has always been God's way, we've boiled it down this morning to that simple choice. Will we trust or will we not? Will we put our trust in Jesus and as Jesus said later, in Him alone because there's no other way to be with the Father? Will we trust in Him or will we continue to trust in the things that we've been taught to trust in? The things that don't seem quite so too good to be true. Because we understand them better. Things like money. 
Jesus later will also say that it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I found one commentary one time that tried to explain that away. Tried to tell me that there was a, uh, a, a gate in the city wall in Jerusalem that was called the eye of a needle and it wasn't built right in the top was just a little bit too low and so you had to take the top row of packages off your camel to get him into the city. Folks, that's not what Jesus was saying. And we know that because of the way the apostles reacted. Their immediate reaction to that was then who can be saved? See, when they heard Jesus say that, they didn't think of some odd-shaped gate in Jerusalem. They thought of a sewing needle compared to a camel. Whether he's got packages on him or not, he's not going through that eye of a needle. It's just not natural. But God said, or Jesus said with man, that's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We need to trust him that our money is not going to save us. Even though our money may buy us better insurance and we get better health care, or it may buy us a better, a better house in a better part of town, and so we have better security, ultimately money does not provide what we really need. Neither does comparison. This is the one that I hear most often. People will put their faith in the fact that they are better than someone. I actually had someone tell me one time that at least they were better than Adolf Hitler. I thought to myself, is that really the comparison you want? He executed 10 million people in those concentration camps. Are you saying, well, you only caused 5 million people to die? Does that make you a better person? They didn't realize that when Jesus came, he skewed the curve. You can't compare to other people anymore. You have to compare to Jesus, the only human being who never, ever, even once had one thought that violated his Father's will. He was perfect and set the standard at perfect and leaves us all in need of his grace. We can't talk about our accomplishments. We can't talk about how many years we sat in the same seat in that church every Sunday? We can't talk about the day we got up and went up in front of everybody and, and made the tremendous sacrifice of kneeling and saying a prayer at the front of the church. None of that, none of those accomplishments changes our relationship with God. We can't talk about our relationships it doesn't matter if you know kings and presidents. It doesn't matter if you know city councilmen or rich people. None of that influences God when he looks at your life and sees the price of your penalty. And perhaps one of the most damaging things that we put our faith in in the 21st century is substances. You know, I did not believe that substance abuse was so rapid in Enid until they legalized medical marijuana. And then I went out and looked for a building, and I found out there was not an empty building in this entire town because they were all filled with dispensaries. And how many people were putting their faith in a substance called marijuana to relieve their anxieties and their pains... When for 40 years, the medical community's been saying it doesn't work, and it causes other problems. And I realize there may be people in this room or on the video that are watching this who use medical marijuana, and if your doctor says to do it, do it. But don't put your faith in that. It ruins lives. Other substances were, ruin them worse. Things like crack cocaine or methamphetamines. I had a friend one time. Uh, he was a, um, an ex-drug user. And I asked him one time if he ever experimented with the harder drugs. And he laughed at me. He said, Mike, I, was, I didn't experiment. I was into hardcore research. He said, I, I had it so bad one time, there was no food in my refrigerator. So I decided to get wasted. I didn't. I didn't ask him. I should have asked him if, if he had money to get wasted. Why didn't he just go buy groceries? But he was so warped by these 
substances that he decided to get wasted. He got wasted for three or four days. When he came back down, he said, somebody stole my refrigerator. They don't make life better. And they definitely don't give you any security for eternity. Nothing is as trustworthy as Jesus. Jesus deals with the real issues. Jesus addresses the things that really happen in, in a sinner's life. The guilty feelings that we have. The things we remember that we did that we wish we hadn't have done. The shame that comes from realizing how that affected other people. The bondage that we have towards those habits that we just can't break by ourselves. The illnesses and the death that it brings. And the sin that other people commit that affect us. The hopes that get broken. The future that is lost. The relationships that aren't what they should have been. Jesus addresses all of this. Coming to an altar, going to Sunday school, giving tithes, those are all great things. But they come after receiving the gift of salvation. They're in response to the great wonder that God has performed for us. They don't cause it. We need to be careful that we remember to put our trust in the right things. Even though it seems too good to be true that God would do this and expect nothing in return, there are tremendous things that happen. Not just a future where someday my body will die and things will get good then, but right now you can feel the love of God. I don't know how you experience the love of God. For me, it's usually in prayer. That's why I get up early in the morning and, and have some time of quiet just with God and I can feel him, His presence and His love. For others, it's, it's singing. For some, it's ministry. But if you've never felt the love of God, I'm just going to say it. I, I hope this doesn't come off too harsh, but if you have never felt the love of God, something's wrong. And I would encourage you to talk to someone about that. You can talk to one of the deacons in the church. Uh, if they need some help, they can come and talk to me, or you can just come straight to me, and we'll talk about why you haven't experienced that feeling of the love of God. Because God loves you. That's why he let Jesus come. I, I say it that way on purpose. He let Jesus come because I believe Jesus came voluntarily because he loves you. And when he returned to heaven, he asked his father and his father sent the Holy Spirit who wanted to come because he loves you. And we should be able to feel that love. You'll, you'll realize the justification that's happened, that that... Uh, Somebody tried to define justification one time as, as just as if I've never sinned. That sounds good for children. That's not what the, the real concept is. The real concept is the court acknowledges that you're guilty. But in justification, there is no fine. Somebody else has already paid it. When we stand before God in judgment... Satan will stand and accuse, and you'll have to hang your head. Everything he talks about, I did. He's, got, he's, he's not going to have any trouble with me. He's going to find plenty of things to point out. But then the judge says, you're guilty. And Jesus says, he is, but I paid the fine. There's no more fine. In fact, there was a legal phrase for that. In um, ancient Greek and Rome, it was called, the word was tetelestai. And Jesus used that word on the cross. As he hung on the cross, he'd been there for about six hours now. And he cried out, translated in our Bible, it is finished. That was the legal way of saying the fine has already been paid. Your fine has already been paid. You are justified before God. 
It also seems too good to be true. The liberation we can experience. The freedom from the negative thoughts and the irrational feelings and the habitual sin and the bondage that that's had on us for all of our life and ultimately the future that we're promised. To be in the presence of God Himself. To be considered His children and heirs within His kingdom. That makes you a prince or a princess through faith in Jesus Christ in an eternal kingdom. I had a buddy one time, his name was Danny, and he had a rough life. Every time he'd come into church, I would say, uh, here comes Prince Danny, and he'd get all red and embarrassed. But that's true of you. As children of God, you are heirs of the kingdom, princes and princesses. Does it seem too good to be true? Jesus was born to fulfill a promise that in many ways seems too good to be true. Except it is. We know Jesus died on the cross. We know he rose from the dead. And he's made all these promises that you can trust. Let's pray. Oh, Father... Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your grace, for the mercy that you've given us, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that removes the penalty that we justly deserve from you, and for the hope for the future that starts right now. Father, if there's anyone in this room who has questions about that or somehow knows that they are not really a partaker in the grace of Jesus Christ, I ask you not to let them leave this room without receiving your gift of eternal life and the freedom and the blessing that it brings. For the rest of us, Father, As we go out of this building, may we be a light shining on a hill that others will see the way we live in response to your great grace and give you glory for it by receiving that same gift. I ask you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.